Well, good afternoon. I'm Tim Rhyme. I am the Director of Marketing and Communications at the Alliance for Natural Health USA, and I'm really thrilled to welcome you all here. Um, today, we're going to have an intergenerational conscious conversation of consequence. Now, whether you're joining us via our website, if you're on FaceTube, YouTube, Periscope, some other tube, um, we're happy to have you here um, and to discuss the topic of cronyism, which I think is a really important topic. Um, just as a matter of bookkeeping, uh, as we get started here, if uh, you aren't able to stay for the whole event, don't worry, this will be posted in its entirety after, so you can go back on and check anything you may have missed. Um, I also want to point out that as we go through our discussion, I would encourage, I, I really hope you do, because this is supposed to be a conversation. So if you have any comments or questions you have, you can type those into the comment section on whatever platform you're in. And we're going to, I can't promise we'll get to all of them, but we will certainly get to as many as we possibly can. Um, so I'm really excited. This is a really a new thing for us. We never have done live streaming before as an organization. Um, so this is, you're, you're kind of our beta test. So, you know, uh, hopefully we don't drop the ball too badly. And if we do, I hope you forgive us. Um, but today we have somebody really, uh, somebody that I absolutely love um, that's going to be our featured guest. Absolutely one of my favorite people and artists on the planet. But before I introduce her, um, I'd like to introduce you to her art and also to the intent of the event. So if you'll just stay tuned, I'm gonna move myself and take a look at this. Wow, I love that. And I absolutely love Ruth's art. Um, and I, I, I hope you all appreciate it as much as I do. You know, we really wanted to um, introduce you to the art first because that is our launch pad for what we're gonna talk about today. And the person that we're going to talk with first is uh, of course, the artist herself, Ruth Westreich. Um, she's a philanthropist, author, and artist. She's the founder and president of the Westreich Foundation, which generously supports and seats fun, uh, funds to people and uh, nonprofit organizations that challenge the normalcy bias. She addresses the collective learned response to accept the unintended consequences of decisions that put profits and power before people and the planet. Ruth believes it is possible to overcome this bias through education, engagement, and action, allowing each of us to become a change maker. Welcome and thanks for joining us, Ruth. Thank you, I'm so happy to be here. And you're also one of my favorite people. <laughs> Well, Ruth, we all know, um, or maybe we don't, so I'll bring it up and you know, I'm, I point out the obvious to those who do know. We all know that art is one of the longest, lives method, longest lived methods of communication among human beings. 
Um, you know, we only have to think back to the cave paintings of our Neolithic ancestors. But perhaps as we've relied more and more on the written word, journalism, and you know, more recently broadcast media to communicate about what's going on, many people tend to think of art as an aesthetic or from an emotional point of view. Um, and activism, which also has a long history, especially in difficult times uh, like those we face today. So how have you brought these two different things that have been around for a long time together, the art and your activism? Well, there's actually three things. Okay, so let's get the third. I'm an, I'm an artist, I am an activist, and I'm a philanthropist. And I, for many years, I mean, I have been an, uh, an artist as long as I can remember. I have been painting and drawing since I was probably, well, maybe seven years old. Um, and I have a certain degree always been an activist as well, because I see myself as one of those change maker people that can help make a difference for those people who don't have a voice. Which is, which is unfortunately most of the people. But, you know, art touches, moves, and inspires people to action. And it always has. When you look at a piece of art, you are moved in your heart space. You intake that um, in a very different way than you take the written word. Written words are very, very linear. They go into your brain, and right away, there is a disconnect. But if you could start with the art, then that gives you, at least it's, it's working out that way. It is giving us a reason to come together to enter conversations with intergenerational people, young people in particular, because they're who is going to receive this planet um, in the not too distant future when my generation is no longer here. And um, so, it all started, no, I didn't start to paint a body of work at all. Um, there is a piece that you saw at the very end. I call it the piece that painted itself. Um, I felt like I had something to say. I wasn't sure what, it just sort of came to me. And I think I was as surprised as anyone about it because most of the time I paint very beautiful things. And I thought, well, maybe it's just a one-off. You know, maybe that's all I have to say about this. I never started out to do a body of work. And a couple of weeks later, I'm thinking to myself, oh, my goodness, big banking, global big banking. You know, that's too big to fail. So what happens when we have global banking systems that are too big to fail? Where is the incentive to do the right thing? So there was another one. And then after that, there was another one and another one. So far, I have... 22 pieces. Um, they are in two major universities. They are in the curriculum of five different departments at USD. Um, and I'm having conversations with many, many people in many different walks of life. So that's, I think, the entry point when people start looking at my art. And also, Tim, you kind of alluded, there's something called social practice art. And social practice art is when artists in a community, along with um, community members, um, the people that run that community, all get together and say, let's do something inspirational to build community. And so that's called social practice art. And we actually wrote about it in our book, Creativity Unzipped. Um, but I do believe that I was never drawn to activist art because most of what I saw um, was not, it was hard for me to look at. And because I painted beautiful things, very colorful, uh, people were drawn into it simply visually because of the way it looks. And then when they start looking at it deeper, they can see that there's a lot in there. And then they will start asking questions and then that conversation opens up. So I don't claim to be an expert in any of these areas. I'm a thinking person. I have an opinion, obviously, but I don't want you to be, you know my opinion. I want you to find your own opinion. I want you to be a creative thinker and we want to lead you in how to do that and then give you resources so that you can do that. You, you, you bring up an interesting um, uh, relationship between art and activism. 
And I'm, I'm just curious, you know, if you, if you look historically, you know, obviously we've seen pro protest art throughout the years. Do you see it as a sign of the times that during certain periods of time in history, um, there is a rise or is this a constant thing? So is, is there more protest art when, when you have wars and famines and, and big happenings? And what does that say about the era? Or is this something that's just always with us? Um, artists express. That's what they do, whether it's visual, whether it's whatever media it is, that's what they do. It just so happens. And um, we should do some research on this. So please feel free to do that. Um, activist art is the fastest growing art genre, which tells you that the artists of the period, the creatives of the period have something to say about what is going on in the world. And it's usually the artists in a very stressed world environment that the artists, the writers, the educators, the scientists, those are usually the first people that start to get silenced. Um, but today, because of social media, because of all of the technology that we have um, at our disposal, artists have something to say and they're saying it and it is getting heard. And one, and obviously the topic we're going to be talking about today is the topic of cronyism, um, which, you know, is really just the fact that special interests, you know, those with money and power have sort of hijacked the intended function of government and institutions. They're supposed to protect the citizenry and instead, you know, they're utilizing these things to just increase their power and influence. So how big a problem do you think cronyism is in our modern world? I mean, is, is this unprecedented? Have we been here before? And how do you engage with this topic? Because I know this topic runs all throughout your artwork. So how do you engage with this in, through, in your work? Well, that's how, that's how the body of work happened because each topic that came to me was because of the other topic that I just did. And I could see that there was this thread that was running through everything whether it was prophets before people in the planet, which is the obvious one, that we are now prophets before everything. And that's not sustainable. Mother nature is not going to let that happen. We are using mother nature as a product to be bartered with and sold. And that can't happen. So I think that, uh, Cronyism today is more important because of social media, because of AI. Um, we are able to reach people in a way that we have never been able to reach people before. And when we have, when we can reach large numbers of people, we can start to, um, for the good and the not so good, we can start them thinking in a way that they wouldn't normally think. Yesterday, I watched, it came across my desk and I watched this amazing video. So I really, really would like everyone to see it. That was um, Mike Wallace in 1958, interviewing Adolf Huxley, mm -hmm. who wrote Brave New World. And this, when I wrote, when I read Brave New World, I was in, I think it was a high school or something like that. I mean, I had to put it down. It was the scariest thing for me that I had ever read because I thought this couldn't possibly happen to humanity. Couldn't possibly, no way. And then I see this video that happened in 1958 and Huxley predicted exactly where we are now. And the technology was not there. It wasn't invented, but he was so savvy about people and how you can direct people's thinking without them knowing it. And he, he made reference to Madison Avenue at the time, who has often made the statement that if you get kids young enough, you'll have them for life. And that's exactly what happens to young people on social media. If you can get them young enough, you'll have them for life. 
you know, you actually inspired me to go back and reread Brave New World because it's been, you know, back since high school, since I read it. And you're absolutely right. I mean, it is chilling when you look at it from a modern perspective and we'll go back and, and analyze what he was seeing so far in advance. I mean, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's, it's pretty frightening, pretty frightening stuff. Well, at this time, we're going to, we're going to shift gears. We're going to bring in the rest of our panel. Um, and uh, the first person I'd like to introduce is uh, Gretchen Dubow. Um, Gretchen is a lifelong activist, environmentalist, and devotee to natural health and healing. She's an attorney with 20 years experience working to change policies that promote the, the preservation of our environment um, and keep uh, our children from being poisoned, uh, minimize threats to our health freedom. In 2008, Gretchen joined as the executive and legal director for the Alliance for Natural Health USA, where she works to shift the current medical paradigm to one that embraces natural and integrative medicine as a standard of care. She also holds a master's degree in applied healing arts, is a student of herbal medicine, and is the mother of the adorable children, Sky and Bodhi. <laughs> so welcome, Gretchen. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Tim. Good to be here. <laughs> Um, and next on our prestigious list is Dr. Robert Verkirk. He is a multidisciplinary scientist with a 35 year background in environmental sustainability, agriculture, food, nutritional and health sciences. Try to say that three times fast. Um, he has a master of science and doctorate degrees from Imperial College London, where he worked as a postdoctoral research fellow. In 2002, he founded the Alliance for Natural Health International, a nonprofit change organization that works toward protecting, developing, and implementing innovative and health, sustainable healthcare approaches to natural and sustainable medicine. Today, he remains the executive and scientific director of ANH International and the scientific director of ANH USA. Welcome, Rob. Great to be with you all. <laughs> and last and certainly not least is uh, Joe Twombly, who is our Deputy Director um, for the Alliance for Natural Health USA. I'm a, I'm a member there too, so that's why I say R. Um, in this role, she leads ANH's legislative and advocacy efforts. Prior to her time at the Alliance for Natural Health, Joe served as a legislative assistant for a member of Congress and has much experience working in government affairs and grassroots advocacy for nonprofit organizations and trade organizations. So welcome to you as well, Joe. Thanks, good to be here. So I want to ask. I'm going to open this up to the to the panel. Um, so and maybe we'll just go in the order I introduced you, just so we're not all screaming over each other. Um, so how does the beautiful work? And I, I really do think it is beautiful. I, I, I we can talk about the politics of it all we want, but it, as art, it is beautiful. It is it is really fantastic work, especially when you see it in a, in a line like that. I really like that video and how it progresses through the whole series. Um, so how does it speak to each of you regarding the effects of cronyism as you see it from your individual perspectives in Western society? And uh, Gretchen, why don't we start with you? Well, first, I mean, I would echo your sentiments. I mean, it's absolutely stunning. Ruth's art is, is tremendous. And, um, and Ruth, you're absolutely right. I mean, it hits me right here, you know, right in the heart. And it kind of like bypasses all of the mental biases and it's kind of like right there in your face. Like, yes, this I know to be true. Um, and so it inspires thinking um, and feeling and kind of experiencing on all of these levels at once. And so it's incredibly powerful. And I just need to thank Ruth so much for her work because it's, it's inspiring and, um, and it means a lot to me personally. And I also, I think, yes, it definitely um, effects of cronyism on Western society. What, what's, what's striking about Ruth's paintings is that they really remind me of like a hologram where you see the whole in every piece. So her pieces, I mean, whether it's on environment or too big to fail, you know, big tech, I mean, she paints a lot of different um, sort of issue areas, but in all of those, I mean, the cronyism is just infiltrated. Right. I mean, you can see it is so pronounced that um, this cronyism kind of is interwoven in all of the pieces that they all, you know, have that in common. And 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 that is so true in Western society. Um, her most recent piece or one of her most recent pieces, Puppet Master, with the various stages and you have like these little fingers and the Puppet Master is kind of like 
holding the strings, but you're 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 diverted by these shiny objects and this different activity and you know this all of this kind of um, you know these different things happening that kind of like divert your attention away from the strings and, and that is so much um, clear to me in, in Western society that it's happening on so many different levels. So it, it's 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 just um, very powerful and I think like to take it to something concrete we can look at the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. So here we have a governmental entity whose mission is to protect the public health. And I think most people believe that that's what the FDA does. Um, but a majority of the FDA's budget is derived from pharmaceutical companies. Through PDUFA, a law passed in the 90s that uh, requires drug companies to pay FDA for drug approval. And so, in fact, um, drug companies are signing the checks, I mean, for all intents and purposes. And drug companies, their interests are very different than the public health. Um, I mean, when we really, really look at it, there, there can be some conflicts there. So when the FDA acts, are they acting in alignment with their mission to protect the public health, or are they acting in alignment with the, the, the interests of the drug companies, which as um, corporate entities literally have a legal duty to bring, you know, economic, uh, you know, benefit to their shareholders. It's all about making money. Um, and then an even more concrete example that this earlier this week, um, FDA came out with an announcement. They uh, shared with us a warning on ivermectin, which is an anti-parasitic drug. It has been um, in the market <coughs> for, you know, decades. Um, I think quite successfully, it has a fairly um, high safety profile and it's off patent. It's an old drug. It's been used forever. You kind of know what to expect from the drug in terms of side effects. And it's inexpensive. It's very inexpensive because it's no, it no, they no longer have this sort of m monopoly market, right? When a new drug is approved, the new drug initially has this monopolistic sort of market mm -hmm. Um, share period of time and it's patented and it's shiny and it's new and it's very expensive um, and, and in fact the drug approval process is created to to allow that it's it's like a pay-to-play process where drug companies have to pay hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to jump through the hoops and all of the RCTs the random controlled trials so that they can become approved and, and, and they design it this way on purpose right because they can pay to play and no one else can um, so, so that's sort of the new drugs, but I don't imagine old drug. Um, so FDA issues this warning, I is something to be wary of, um, because number one, it is not approved for the treatment of COVID. So the other piece of the story <laughs> is that, <laughs> I hear you laughing. The other piece of the story is that ivermectin has, um, been used quite successfully, um, clinically and uh, which I've you know, heard a lot of reports clinically of ivermectin being used to treat COVID. And there are also a handful of maybe five to seven small RCTs that have been conducted recently showing that ivermectin is, is um, useful in treatment of COVID. So anyway, FDA issues this warning, number one, ivermectin is not approved to treat COVID. Well, yes, we know that because it's this off patent old drug. They're not gonna spend the money to get it approved for this new use because it, they can't charge the necessary money to recoup that investment. The system isn't structured to allow that. Um, so number one, it's not an approved drug to treat COVID. And number two, um, people need to use care because they could overdose. So I'm thinking this is true in all cases. People always need to use care and making sure they don't overdose on any drug. I'm looking for the new information here. When I see this report, it's, it's like, what's, so the FDA is here to protect public health. In what way is the public health at risk because of ivermectin? Um, clinically, I'm hearing that it's helping a lot of patients with COVID. Um, so it's confusing as um, are many of the things that FDA does, but only for about 24 hours because the next morning, the newspapers are covered with headlines. Merck, Merck, huge drug company, um, is in the process of studying a new drug, new drug called um, Malnuprevir, um, something like that. And um, they're very excited about it. All of the papers are saying that this could be it. This could be the new drug that will 
um, save us all from COVID. Now it still needs to be studied. We have no idea about the safety profile or efficacy. We don't have a lot of information. What we do know is it's a new drug. Um, so there are a lot of unknowns and it will be expensive and eventually um, will probably cost thousands and thousands of dollars. So you couple this together and, and, um, and, I, and I, we see this all the time. You know, FDA has this announcement about this sort of alternative treatment out there. It's like, okay, d don't do that. Um, but hey, look what Merck has got coming down the pipeline for us. And um, I mean, it happens all the time. FDA is being controlled by the puppet strings, pharmaceutical company. FDA also prevents um, the dissemination of information on you know natural health remedies, dietary ingredients, dietary supplements. Um, most recently, physicians can't blog about the protocols that they're using to treat their COVID patients. We can't show this information publicly because none of these things are approved drugs. And of course, they're not approved drugs because they are, can't be patented the way that, you know, these new to nature synthetic um, drugs are. And, and vitamin D is $11 a bottle. If you want to take that through the new drug approval process and spend 500 billions of dollars, um, at, at the end of the day, it's still going to be $11 for that bottle of vitamin D. There's no money to do it. Yet we all know that vitamin D is incredibly important um, in, in immune system um, and, and 200 different mechanisms within the body um, that we know of, but in, and of course in preventing and treating COVID too. So um, we see this all the time. A fantastic example, Greg, and you're right. And the underlying issue is always follow the buck, right? I mean, at the end of the day, that's always always what this is about. Rob, I'm going to turn it over to you. What are, what, let, me, let me get your thoughts on that same question. Well, on, on that question, um, I mean, extraordinary what's happening with ivermectin. It, it is an incredible example of, of cronyism. I mean, let's just get some perspective on this. In the US, they round about 40% of all drug use is off-label. So you can choose to pick on one particular player that, that is, um, and, and the safety record is, is impeccable. Um, by the by, I happen to have my 90-year-old uh, mother and 94-year-old father on it, um, and they're doing really well. Um, but um, yes, it, it's, that is a, a great example. Um, obviously, want to come back to Ruth Art. Um, just it was great ruth hearing you talk ab about huxley um i think we mentioned that that his birthplace and where he grew up was literally a stone's throw from our office in in surrey in england of course he grew up in 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 Godalming, so um literally just down the road from where we are um and it is totally extraordinary to see that um that that has come to pass and you know what? What I really get my, my background is is as an ecologist, and ecology is really all about interconnectedness. And um, there is no doubt that in nature, a lot of things eat many other things. And so you could argue that um, when corporates eat innocent citizens, eat effectively enslave, however you want to look at it, um, there is a line of argument that says you know, well, perhaps that's okay because, you know, predators are doing the same to herbivores and other predators all the time. Um, there is a big difference. There's always payback in nature. Um, the process that happens in nature is all about cycling. And again, Ruth, I think you pick this up so beautifully in your art. The, 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 you show very much when the interconnectedness is is harmonious versus when it lacks that kind of resonance and um the other thing i would say is that because of the visual communication medium the way in which you use color um is really extraordinary um and uh you know i i see in so many of your paintings you know fiery dangerous colors associated with with dangerous interactions and you know, that, that really, um, I think, is where we need to kind of understand what it is to be human. I, I think the process, as Huxley has said, that we've been going through over the last 12 months is really about dehumanization. It's about um, disengaging, putting people into such a state of fear that they move to their kind of smoke detector, midbrain, 
you know, if you look at the evolution of the human brain in, in three phases, we have our brain stem um, that, that, is, that is really the, the most primitive part of our brain, our reptilian brain. And then we evolve the next, the midbrain, the next stage of the brain. And, and there we, we really are in the same boat as, as most of the primates. Um, and of course, the unique thing about humans is we develop this huge forebrain and these frontal lobes where all the, this extraordinary creativity, I'm not suggesting that creativity doesn't exist in nature. Some of it appears to be genetic. Some of it is definitely behavioral. But um, this huge brain of ours that is incredibly creative um, has the remarkable capacity for reasoning and rationalization this this when we go into a place of fear we we actually isolate ourselves from that forebrain and um and i do think art and creativity people's experience of it is something that can bring them back into a, a different space partially because they uh, as i think everyone has been saying um, uh, Ruth and Gretchen really focused on this, this idea of being in the heart center, coming out of the brain. But of course, the, the brain and the gut um, and the heart are intimately connected. And of course, as we increase our understanding of what it is to be human, we also understand that probably we go way beyond the the, the biochemistry and the genetics that we're currently stuck in until we start thinking about you know energy centers um which is of course what has been a major focus in understanding what it is to be human in many other cultures um, um so-called primitive cultures isn't it interesting as we as we focus more and more on technology we seem to dissociate more from being human and um and we're in a really difficult place and and, and i love Ruth, what you're doing in terms of also the intergenerational connecting. And in fact, um, we're taking you up on, on your word for it. And um, I think you, you already will have heard that we're, we, we have an intern based in, in Los Angeles who's going to be coming down to interview you um, because she is so passionate about being an activist. And um, and when we were talking about putting a movie together as part of her internship, because she's very creative, she's a polymath, she's also an amazing scientist. Um, she, when I told her what you were doing and then took her to your website and she looked at your paintings, she, it was, it was like she'd read a book because she could see in each painting so much communication and I just had another hour session with her last night and she's super excited to be able to go and interview you at your exhibition at the University of San Diego. Um, in terms of where we are with cronyism and this, this sort of greedy sort of exploitation of humanity, um, you know, when, when are people going to wake up? What is going to wake them up? Um, four days ago in the UK, um, there's a guy called Boris Johnson, who's meant to be the prime minister, who's just four days ago through the high court in London, the highest court in, in, in England, has found him guilty of not disclosing around about 100 commercial contracts that were handed out to mates for PPE and other um, contracts, basically the things that, that didn't work. Um, millions of taxpayers' money has been handed out. Um, and um, for some reason, um, people like Boris Johnson, from a very privileged background, seem to think that they're immune for, from accountability. They are contemptuous of um, transparency. Um, the highest court in the land has found him guilty, and he carries on as if nothing had happened. And, and I think that's when we really need to start engaging the frontal lobes of our brain. And um, let's hope we do it more by looking at the kind of art that Ruth is creating for us. Very well said, very well said. Um, I'm just going to post something, uh, an interesting, I'm getting some interesting comments here. I'm going to post one up on the board. This is from 
Kelly Gray Meisner. And Kelly, I apologize if I'm saying your name wrong, um, but I, I, I really like uh, what, what she has to say here. Cronyism is the national natural evolution of the parasitic puppet masters of colonialism and capitalism. I love that. We uh, have to address the foundations of cronyism in order to make a difference. Beautiful work, Ruth. Um, Thank you so much for the comment and everybody that's tuning in out there, please feel free to post your comments, your questions. Um, I am now going to, uh, let me, let's, let's turn it over to Joe. Joe, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, Ruth's art and cronyism and how it touches you? Yeah, so I really love how bright and colorful Ruth's pieces are, um, especially, you know, all the different aspects that her art depicts that cronyism is negatively impacting because Unfortunately, you know, the, the impacts are really far reaching in our society. Um, and she shows, you know, how it's negatively impacting our communities, our environment. I like her depictions of the, you know, increasing pollution, unfortunately, that it's, it's hurting the effectiveness of our government institutions. Um, and as you study her art, it really makes you think about how pervasive cronyism is in our society. So I, I love all the variety and how bright and, it, and impactful that her art is. Um, it just really makes you think about how it's really, it's everywhere, unfortunately, and how we have to, to fight all these different aspects of cronyism throughout our society right now. And I can speak more on cronyism in a second. I suppose we're gonna ask another question on that. Well, well feel free to keep going. If I didn't mean to interrupt you if you're if you on a roll, but I, I, I do have some other questions, yeah. Oh, let me, Ruth, you're on mute. Let me unmute you there. There you go. Um, Kelly Gray Meissner is a very talented health practitioner and poet. And when you go onto my website, I have written an ebook. And beside each piece, Kelly Gray Meissner has written um, a compounded haiku. And they are brilliant, brilliant. So check it out. All right, absolutely. Uh, good shout out there for for Kelly. Um, so we are going to try to wrap this up by the top of the hour. So I'm keeping an eye on the time, but I am going to try to carve out enough time at the end for any questions. So again, I encourage everybody who's out there, post your questions in the comment section, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook or whatever else you're on. Uh, just post those questions there and supposedly they're going to funnel through. So let's hope that happens. Um, so let me, let me ask you all another question and I'll, I'll leave this open to the panel and Joe, maybe we'll start with you this time. Um, so I, uh, given the role of a &H as an organization whose mission it is to protect personal freedom and access to, uh, whole person patient centered healthcare accompanied by evidence-based healing modalities. Boy, that was a really mouthful. Um, but, but really well said. Uh, so let's, let me repeat that. So we get that right. Whole person patient centered care accompanied by evidence-based healing modalities. So can each of you, and Joe, we'll start with you, uh, speak to what you see as the largest current threat from your perspective. Now, obviously there are threats everywhere and we've already talked about how ubiquitous this is. Um, and Ruth has a really cool painting about how ubiquitous it is across all of the different realms of our, of our society, um, but we, we won't go there. So what do you see as the biggest threat, Joe? We'll start with you. Yeah, I think going to sort of what Gretchen talked about earlier about the biggest issue being the significant amount of funding that the FDA receives from pharmaceutical companies. And then therefore the very close relationship that the FDA has with drug companies. You know, as a result of this, the FDA is really working to block access to and information about products that compete with or lower the demand of the FDA approved drugs. So just to give a couple of examples, um, you know, compounded bioidentical hormones are used by millions of women across the United States to help manage their symptoms of menopause. And, and there's other issues that they need, to, they need to deal with hormonal imbalances. But that, that's now threatened. Bioidentical hormones are now threatened by the FDA because they compete with the FDA approved hormone therapy drugs. And women and doctors consistently say that they prefer the compounded bioidentical hormone options that are per personalized to the individual patient's needs and are chemically the same as the body makes naturally. But the FDA doesn't listen to the women and doctors and instead it continues to push for FDA approved drugs. Um, to give another example, um, access to homeopathic medicines. They've been safely used for hundreds of years by millions of people around the world and in the US. And yet the FDA is moving to eliminate homeopathy in the United States. It says that this 
inherently safe form of medicine that so many Americans rely upon should now go through an impossible FDA approval process. And cronyism also harms Americans' access to information about food and supplements that can help prevent and treat and cure disease. So rather than supporting access to information about inexpensive, safe, effective, natural options that can help our health, such as vitamin D, as Gretchen mentioned earlier, the FDA and the FTC are blocking doctors and supplements from sharing this information, and they're only permitting FDA-approved drugs to tell you about how they can benefit your health. So certainly a lot of issues surrounding those, those problems. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll lob it up in the air. Who wants to, who wants to jump in next? I'm happy. All right, Rob. Uh, no, I'll, I'll make it really short, um, and I'm going to be controversial here. Um, you, you remember during, you know, the, the concerns over fossil fuels and when we saw the rise of, of, uh, of nuclear, um, there was a lot of work done to see what would happen if you were looking at a really traumatic solution to eliminate the existing fossil fuel energy industry. And it, it looked like it would take something like eight weeks of people not going to gas stations. And then, you know, Exxon, Mobil, all, Shell, BP, they would all collapse. And I think, you know, the, the biggest threat in my book is really the fact, the lack of awareness amongst citizens. Because if, if citizens were to just stop buying if they came out of a place of fear and, and, and stopped buying into the system that is being sold to them, we could change things very, very quickly. And, um, you know, rather than trying to pull down, it is a David and Goliath battle. And we could, we could spend multiple generations trying to pull down um, a Goliath that's being fed all the time by people just buying into um, the deception, the lies, the cronyism. So I think a much quicker and smarter way around it is to, is to help educate people, to get a sea change of people who just choose to live in a different way, um, to not support the, the fuel that feeds Goliath. So I am being a little controversial there. And it's one of the reasons we focus so much on education. And, and I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. And, and I know we keep going back to Aldous Huxley, but I mean, that was his central thesis, right? That you, you know, and that was the argument be, between um, Brave New World in 1984. Do you need to suppress people f through force or do you need to suppress them through taking over their will and, and making them not care or educate themselves enough or be aware enough to stand up to, to what's actually happening? And I, I absolutely agree with you, Rob. They, they want us to be in battle with them because they can always win those battles. So right. we, can, we can choose to live by example um, and we can choose to, to help others to redirect their behaviors, their spend. Um, and, and we don't therefore need to engage directly all the time because it's very, very difficult to win. I mean, um, they're built for winning battles. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, let me unmute you there, Ruth. I think I got, there we go. Okay. Um, you know, what I see when I, when I, when I do these pieces is that we, we are losing civil rights and civil liberties and we're not even aware of it. And any time that we have those civil rights and civil liberties that get taken away by an executive order, we don't ever get them back. And we don't notice that they're gone until we have to look up and say, oh, we don't have that anymore. You know, I think we can look at the Patriot Act that happened after 9-11. There was a lot of stuff going on then. We never got those back. And we have that history in our government. I mean, I can only really speak for the United States. But we have that history of when we take something away during an emergency, we don't get it back. And all of a sudden, you don't realize that it's missing and you start living your life like that's the way it's going to be. But now with so much social media and, and not being able to have a civil discourse, which is what is missing, uh, we need a civil discourse about all of these issues and let people make up their own mind. But that's the way that I would do it. That's the way it should be done. 
in a democracy. So we have to look at ourselves all around the globe and say, under our current circumstances, are we really living in a democracy or have we given that up and we don't even realize it? Really Gretchen, I see you shaking your head there. Uh, no, I just agree with everything that everyone is saying. And Rob, I appreciate the controversy. We expect nothing less from you. I mean, that's <laughs> what we do. That's who we are. So I appreciate that. Um, no, I, I agree with everything Rob said, everything Ruth and Joe. I mean, I think that we're all making some important points here. Um, what is most at risk? I mean, I, I'm sort of reiterating, but I, um, or what are the biggest problems or issues. I mean, I, I'm thinking of fear and insecurity. I think that people are afraid and they're insecure. They're afraid to use their own voices. They're afraid to ask questions. And I mean, I understand why. FDA, FTC are telling doctors, if you blog about, you know, quercetin for COVID, we're going to take your license away. You'll no longer be able to practice and feed your family. Um, that's scary. And, um, you know, let's talk about the vaccine. Now, that's really something scary. If you want to ask reasonable questions that are um, based on, you know, a scientific peer-reviewed published paper that you read. I mean, if you're going to do that online, you're going to lose your Twitter and your Facebook account, be accused of spreading fake news, you're going to be discredited. Um, vaccine controversy is nothing new. Katie Couric, you know, a couple of years, a few years back, she asked a couple of questions about the HPV vaccine and boy, I mean, it was swift and hard. She was discredited. Like, I mean, it was, it was maddening what happened to her. I mean, she was shamed. She was shamed for asking questions about whether or not this was healthy for little girls. And reporters got the message. You're gonna ask these questions. <laughs> you know, there goes your, you know, your platform, your profession. That's scary. Um, you know, mommy communities blogging, asking questions about vaccines back and forth. I mean, they're shaming. You didn't get vaccinated. Shame on you. You did get vaccinated. Shame on you. So people are afraid to use their voices. They're afraid to say anything. They're insecure. They, they're not sure they can think for themselves. It's hard to find good information anyway, any, anymore, anyway, you know, online because it's constantly being um, censored and, and called fake news and taken down. So I think, you know, we have to be brave and reach deep inside ourselves because we know it's kind of like that place where Ruth's art hits me in my heart of hearts. You know what she's painting is true. Even if you can't quite language it, it's like we know what's true. And, um, you know, we have to use our voices. It's That's what's at risk here. Um, you could say it's free speech. You know, of course, it's access to all of these health modalities through all the different cronyism that we're talking about. But you know, if we don't do anything about it, kind of shame on us, right? Because we all have voices. Gretchen, can I, can I just pick up on on the issue of, of truth? Because you know, there is a, if you like, the corollary of of the conspiracy theory movement, which is you know one of one way of denigrating anything that doesn't agree with the mainstream narrative, is is this whole idea that. Um, yeah, I've just got to follow my train there, actually, because I've just had a 15-hour day. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I just picked up that point on... Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, apologies where I was going with that one. Um, pick it up. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, just to get back to the voice, because that's actually... Um, because we are running a little late, and I want to have enough time at the end. Um, Gretchen, you mentioned the fact that we all need a voice. So that's a really good segue into our last uh, question, which relates to hope, because I know at the basis of all of Ruth's work is hope. And without it, you know, there, there, none of this matters, right? We have to have hope at the end of the day. So in light of hope, um, what role do grassroots efforts? And before I do that, I'm actually going to post something because I just got a comment come in because this kind of relates. Um, from Andrew San, and I'm, I'm sorry, I know I, I butcher names, Andrew Santu, I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, but this is exactly what we're talking about. How do people get involved? What can they do? And here we have somebody that is showing, I, I think, one way, right? You reach out and you find out who you can connect with, but I'll, I'll open that up to the group. 
what can people do? What 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 role does everybody that's listening in here or watching here, um, what can they play and how can they go about um, trying to make a difference? I think you have to unmute it, Ruth. I, oh. Unmute. Okay. Um, you know, I think that we all, there's the, the old term is that we um, think globally and then we act locally. And so there's very various levels of action. And you look around your community. First of all, you look within even your family structure. You know, when you sit down to dinner, are you having a conversation of consequence? Are you actually able to talk about some of these things? Or are you simply voicing or parroting what your family's beliefs are, what your faith's beliefs are? So, you know, are you set up to not be a critical thinker for yourself? On my website, I have resources whether it doesn't matter, whether it's climate change, whether it's government overreach, whether it, um, it, you know, there's something that you can do. And there are many, many, many groups out there that want participants. So find somebody that you love. I happen to love or get, well, I love Alliance for Natural Health, obviously. But besides that, I love Organic Consumers Association. They have an amazing newsletter. I mean, one of the great, great environmentalists of our time. So look, look for those things and then sign up for the newsletters. You are not going to get the information that you need on most of the time, Facebook or YouTube. Um, you're going to get it through newsletters where they can go directly to you and you're going to get it through connections. So start making connections. And I hope I got their website right. I just typed one up real quick. I believe that's the right website. We love OCA. Shout out to OCA. Um, but there's a website. Hey, Tim, I remember what it was I was going to say after conspiracy theory. It, go for it. That word just makes your mind go blank. But it was, <laughs> it was about truth. It was about truth. And, and the whole sort of truth seeker movement seems to be the kind of opposite end of conspiracy. And I think one of the problems we have in our society now is that we're meant to live with only one truth and uh, you know as a scientist i would say there isn't a single truth truth is actually not generally objective it's subjective mm -hmm. and if we look back at many of the great cultures if you look back you know thousands of years into early hinduism for example i mean they worshipped kind of multiple gods and they were really comfortable you only have to drive around places like New Delhi to see how complexity can engage with people's lives. And one of the difficulties we've got now is we're, we're being sort of shoehorned into this really narrow way of thinking. And it's either the way that the government and the globalists are saying, or it's the highway. And, um, and I think something we really have to help people to, we've got to ensure that we, we are not too judgmental in our own approach to others because we we've got to live and let live a bit better than we're doing at the moment um and it doesn't mean we need to attack everyone who has a different view or shame them or um and that to me that's the most unfortunate place we're at i, I have a bunch of children and I'm, i feel sad that that we're we're sort of bringing them into this world where they've got to deal with this because let's just coexist a bit better than we've been doing very well I think to, also to talk more about the importance of activism and how people can get involved. Um, I think what Ruth said about, you know, signing up for newsletters, getting educated is really important. And then, you know, you might think your single message or meeting with a member of Congress or with your, you know, local representatives doesn't make much difference. But if you think about it, there's not that many people who are really taking the time to do that, to really send those messages and let their elected officials know how they feel. And so your one voice can actually have an outsized impact. And if enough people do that, that can really change minds with our elected officials and get them to take action on the issues that we need their help with. So, so I encourage you, you know, to, to do what you can to, to take that action. And then I would just, I think that's everybody I, that 
I agree with everything everybody's saying. It's, it's really well put. And the only thing I would add is that we all have different spheres of influence and you never know who you're talking to. Um, meaning you don't know where they're going in life. You don't know who they'll share that message with. And I think it again comes down to um, being secure in what you know and not being afraid to have these tough, hard conversations, um, being brave. So whether it's talking to your family or your children, um, you know, sharing thoughts at work, um, you know, you have to ask yourself, what is your sphere of influence? You know, in, in what way does it feel right to share what you have to say and staying engaged? And of course, in the political processes is really important. But um, but this is a movement. It's not just, I mean, it, it is ultimately political, but, you know, it, it, it's from the ground up. So, I mean, if you think about all of the historical battles that have been fought, and there have been many, and I think of these people and how hard it must have been, um, you know, to really put themselves out there. People put their lives on the line to fight for what they believed in and to win really hard um, won rights and privileges. And I think that many of those battles are still ongoing today. And um, and I think of our battle as very simple. I mean, this is a battle for our health freedom. It's a battle for autonomy over our bodies, access to information, how we're going to care for our families. This is huge. I think this is the biggest battle that I will fight in my life. Absolutely. And, um, Right. I mean, it's just it's enormous. It can't be overstated. So, um, you know, now is the moment, you know, you have to be brave and just say what you have to say where you feel it's appropriate and stay engaged, stay educated. And, and Gretchen, I think the other thing we, we have to accept is that in order to move away from the status quo, we have to get uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it is it is an uncomfortable process. And I think a lot of people run back into their comfort zone when they're uncomfortable. And um, just, it, it's a bit like doing, you know, ice bars with Wim Hof. Um, you get used to it after a period, it's pretty uncomfortable initially. And then you start to realize it's actually a good thing. It's good for you, it's good for society, it's good for change. But being a change maker means coming, you know, distancing yourself from the status quo. Um, but it doesn't mean that you need to break down relationships. It actually means you need to build relationships and you also need to focus on talking to people who are in that middle ground rather than just talking to people who agree with you you know if we if we all just have conversations with people who think the same way the, the net effect is zero so we have to sort of find a way of communicating with people who are sitting on the fence you know again you could argue don't waste your time with people who are so committed to a view that's you know a diametric opposite of your own um but you know choose your battles mm -hmm. i'm wondering ruth if you could share that story of um the student who wanted to write about vaccines because that's a perfect oh. example okay um there i have a, a caregiver that works for me who is a lovely lovely young um, african-american woman um, who has been, uh, she's been on dialysis since she was 21. She's 31 now. And she is continuing to go to school. She, I mean, she, her life is difficult um, at, at best. And so she was having to write a paper um, around something around COVID. And she decided, of course, being in my house, right, her eyes are like wide open now. She goes, oh my goodness, I just had no idea. So she decided to write a paper on whether or not there was vaccine safety and um, how that all came about. So she really delved into it and um, she took it to her professor and her professor says, eh, I really wouldn't want you to do that. You know, that could really go against you. Everyone else is writing about COVID. Well, again, my household, you stand up, okay? You don't cave. So she stood her ground. She did her research. I did not give her the research. She did all of her own research. She put the paper in and her professor at the end of the time said, I'm so glad that you did this because you have caused me to look at my thinking and really examine where I got that truth. And we see that every single day. It's a great story and a great illustration of what it takes to uh, 
to, to bring that kind of change. We, we also have, I'm just gonna pop a few of these up here because um, we're getting some great advice from the audience as well. We have Maureen McDonald. <laughs> I think Ruth must know her. Um, about standing shoulder to shoulder. And I think that reiterates what Rob was saying, right? That we, we have to work together on this and find um, coalitions like our friends at OCA, who uh, apparently I didn't screw up their website or they might have said a different message. Um, <laughs> so our good friend Alexis there. Um, and I think this reiterates sort of what uh, Gretchen was talking about with our circles of influence. We all have them, right? And we all can speak within those circles of influence. So I think we have um, some great advice. And unfortunately, as I look up, it is five o'clock and I like to be punctual. Uh, I may not do anything else right, but I tend to be punctual. Um, <laughs> so I, I am going to wrap it up and I'm going to wrap it up with one final banner that I'm going to put up on the screen because as the director of marketing and communications, um, my job is to get you to come to us. So um, one way, and this is a really easy thing that everybody out there can do you can go to any one of these organizations and they're all great organizations. Um, NHUSA, NH International, and of course, Roos, the Westerish Foundation. Um, please visit, you, you, there's some great resources on there. Um, she has a whole book about how to have these conversations of consequence. Ruth, do you wanna close us out with a final word for everyone? Oh, thank you. First of all, I wanna thank you all for doing this because as you said, it hasn't been done before. Um, let's hope it will be the first of many because as once we sort of get a chink in this armor, then it opens it up to even more. And um, one of the things that I am, I'm so concerned about because I speak with the universities and young people and I just heard it again today, our accountant happened to be here. And he said, you know, during today's time, his daughter who is childbearing age is afraid to bring a child into the world. And I hear it over and over and over and over again. It's heartbreaking. It's really heartbreaking. So I think that's what we're, we all need to do our part. We all need to do our part. And together we can do amazing things. We can do incredible things. I am not giving up on this, but it's going to take us working with young people with what they know, they have, they're the ones that are on the front lines now. And they're the ones that are ultimately going to be responsible for whether we fail or, or, or move ahead as a species. But from the older generations, we have this historical knowledge. We can tell you how it was. And we can tell you the mistakes that we have made. One of the things is one of the oldest baby boomers, I feel like whenever I meet somebody, I'd apologize. Like, I'm so sorry we did this to you. We didn't know what we were doing. We were trashing the planet. But, but we do bring that historical knowledge. So together, we can craft solutions. And one of the best ways to do it is to have a conversation where my art opens it up. We all have biases. We agree to leave those at the door and we come on a level playing field and hear from each other, hear each other's truths. And I think that's how we create unique solutions for our time and our planet. So I want to thank everybody for showing up. Um, I hope you got something from this. That's our whole intention. Thank you. And now we can do the Brady Bump bunch wave and say good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you 